right, thank you, Andreas, and thank you to all the uh, organizers for inviting me. So this is going to be a joint work with uh, Jean Bourguin, and I would uh, start with um, reminding you the uh, asymptotic notation. I think you are all familiar uh, with this, but let's just uh, make sure we are on the same page. Uh, so we'll typically have two quantities such as you know a and b. They will be more complicated than this, but uh, this asymptotically last notation uh, will refer to the existence of a constant c, which is universal in the sense that uh, it only depends on fixed parameters such as the dimension of the MBM space or uh, the index uh, p of the uh, Lebesgue space. It will not depend on scales, and uh, you will see lots of deltas and n's. N uh, is um, the spatial scale and delta is typically one over n, the frequency scale. <coughs> uh, you'll also see in particular um, expressions of this sort, um, and you'll read this as uh, A uh, asymptotically less than n to the d plus epsilon for every epsilon positive. Uh, an example, a uh, simple example that we are all familiar with is the fact that log n is dominated by any uh, power of n. And also, I'm going to use this shortcut for uh, uh, exponentials. Um, very good. So um, I gave this talk a few times already, and uh, I feel that a good uh, starting point in this discussion um, is um, the Thomas Stein or Stein Thomas um, restriction theorem, which I'm going to have on the next slide. So the setup is the following um, I'm going to start with um, a hypersurface, let's say C2 which has non-zero Gaussian curvature, and this means that zero is not an eigenvalue of the second um, uh, fundamental form, uh, such as the sphere or the elliptic paraboloid, right? I mean, I truncate it. I'm just looking at the compact um, hypersurfaces. And these, are, these have positive definite second fundamental form, but you can also consider the uh, so-called hyperbolic paraboloid, um, which has both positive and negative eigenvalues. All right, so what's the theorem? <laughs> <coughs> um, the theorem says that if you have a function g which lives on uh, your surface, um, then if you look at the measure g uh, d sigma, sigma being the natural surface measure, if you take the Fourier transform, then this Fourier transform fits inside a certain uh, LT space on the whole Rn, um, provided g is in L2 of the surface. Um, it's a very easy exercise to show that this theorem is actually equivalent uh, with a discrete version, which is formulated here. Namely, um, it implies, and it is implied by this fact, that if you have any set lambda, you know, discrete set lambda, uh, which is delta separated, um, and if you have any points x c in, uh, in the complex uh, plane, then um, if you integrate this exponential sum, uh, in a certain LT space, P being in the same range, um, then you can compare it with the L2, the little L2 norm of the sequence um, with a certain, uh, you know, delta loss. And this is, uh, this is optimal. Um, so what you note here is the fact that R has to be at least delta inverse. Uh, once it holds for this scale, that you can easily show that it holds for all larger scales by just, you know, patching together or covering larger balls with uh, balls of uh, smaller radius. So it's an entirely uh, simple trick. And, uh, I mean, the moral of this story is that um, the um, continuous restriction theorem is about the oscillations at spatial scales uh, equal or larger than one over the frequency uh, separation. Right. So I want you to look at this exponent. Again, it's sharp. And um, um, the thing is that it has been uh, conjectured, observed uh, a while ago that um, further cancellations should occur if you enlarge the spatial scale, if you average over larger balls, uh, meaning you uh, take delta to minus 2 here rather than minus 1. Uh, in the particular subcase when the second fundamental form is uh, positive definite. So I formulate or I call this the discrete uh, restriction conjecture and let's, call, uh, let's look at the supercritical regime. Uh, supercritical meaning that uh, I'm looking at P larger than the uh, Stein-Thomas index. 
And this conjecture asserts that, um, again, if you have a bunch of points which are delta separated, and if the R is as large or larger than delta minus two, um, then you have a similar inequality, except that there's an extra one over P here. If you compare it with the previous one, then um, there is a one over P, okay? So this one over P only, um, I mean, helps you or gets into the picture um, at, at large enough uh, uh, spatial scales. Okay, so I feel this is a good um, uh, comparison between discrete and continuous. Um, and um, I want to point out that there is also a subcritical formulation of the problem where I'm looking at uh, values of P less than the uh, time to mass uh, index. And in that case, um, you know, at the critical index, this number becomes zero. So you only have this uh, silly delta to minus epsilon, which by the way, um, you know, should be ignored. It probably shouldn't be here in the subcritical regime. Our methods cannot uh, remove it uh, in most cases. So let's not uh, bother about that, okay? So this is negligible from the point of view of, uh, of this talk. Um, so what is this? Uh, you can look at this as being um, uh, a reverse Hilder inequality. Um, the L to norm of the exponential sum is the same as uh, the little L to norm of the coefficients. We have, you know, orthogonality. So in other words, the discrete restriction conjecture asserts the fact that uh, the L to norms are equivalent uh, for exponential sums of uh, this sort. Okay. I should say at this point, perhaps, that uh, the assumption that uh, the hypersurface has definite second fundamental form is really important. Um, it fails, for example, for the hyperbolic uh, paraboloid. The reason being that it, uh, this, this paraboloid contains lines, and lines are the enemies. If you choose its frequencies to sit on the line, then there's no way this can hold true. There's no curvature, in other words. Okay. Um, all right. I want to make the point that um, while this discrete uh, restriction phenomenon, at least the way I advertise it, um, is uh, mostly a higher dimensional phenomenon, it also has manifestations in uh, one dimension where, of course, there's no curvature. The curvature is replaced with, uh, let's call it sparsity. Okay, so your sequence has to be uh, growing rapidly or to have some sort of geometry to be well separated and so on. You're certainly very familiar with the little Bailey theory, which has behind um, this equivalence of uh, the LT norms for, uh, for lacunary uh, sequences. Uh, there's a slightly less known example, uh, the squares. Uh, it's an easy exercise. I'm going to show it to you on the next slide uh, to show that the L4 norm um, is comparable uh, to the L2 norm <coughs> up to some um, um, negligible losses. And um, just to stimulate your appetite, um, this is an open question, uh, easy looking problem, um, but, um, you know, not strongly believed to be true, but, you know, methods, our methods in particular do not shed any light on, on this question. So what, what is the proof, um, the warm up proof? What is the proof for, for this fact? Well, you'll see in a second that it relies heavily on the fact that four is not only an integer, but an even integer. So you square the whole, exp well, you take the fourth power of the whole expression, you end up with um, an exponential sum uh, with frequencies, uh, you know, generated uh, by, by this process. And of course, the contributions on the left-hand side come from the quadruples uh, for which this expression is zero. How many times is this zero? Well, you're looking at solutions of this standard equation where A is a fixed number. So you're looking, in other words, at the lattice points on the circle of radius root of uh, A. There's not too many of them, which justifies the, the epsilon loss, all right? So the question is, <clears throat> I mean, this, this example, um, in some sense, um, motivates and explains um, what I'm going to show you next, our whole work. What do you do in the case when, <clears throat> when you're dealing with exponents which are not integers? I mean, this is a very special case. So it's typically the, the LP spaces that you're looking at have um, uh, rational non-integer points, uh, I mean, in this case. So now let's um, go back to, to higher dimensions and I'll provide you with uh, uh, some further motivation. Um, 
And um, you're probably all familiar with the, the sweetheart estimates in, uh, in the periodic case. Uh, Burgen, I think, was the first one to look at this problem in um, uh, what is now his most cited paper um, in 93, a GAFA paper. Um, so he looked at um, the discrete parabolid. Again, you uh, truncate it. Um, and you are only looking at the lattice points this time. Um, and what he proved is the fact that you have um, a Strichardt estimate. We now call it, of course, a, uh, a discrete restriction, but it is a Strichardt estimate. I'm going to come back to this issue in, in a few slides. Uh, so he proved the, the, the conjectured estimate um, in the full range. This is the Stein Thomas index in dimension two and three. Um, and this proof is, uh, is quite easy, quite elementary, uh, because the critical index is six in two dimensions and four in three dimensions, and it follows via the trick that I, I described uh, a bit earlier. Um, it is more complicated in higher dimensions. However, there was a, there was a gap, uh, so he couldn't quite recover the, the whole range. Uh, and the proof of this involved number theory, uh, the circle method. And, and the implementation of the stein thomas uh, argument from the continuous world to the discrete world. Okay. So this was part of, um, part of the motivation um, when working on this problem, at least for me. Um, and um, I'll now get to the main theorem, which is uh, more general, perhaps much more general than um, uh, uh, the discrete uh, theorems that I've described earlier. This is what we call the L2 uh, decoupling theorem. So let me describe it, and maybe I'm going to need a little bit of uh, board here. Uh, I'll cover the theorem for, for a second. Um, so what do you do? Well, you have your hypersurface. Let's say, uh, for simplicity, you have the circle in two dimensions. And you're looking at a delta neighborhood. Uh, this is what you call, I believe, n delta. And then you split it uh, according to curvature. Um, in a rectangle like uh, creatures, uh, parallelepipeds in higher dimensions, um, which have um, length um, roughly delta to, to one half. So you end up uh, with these uh, regions, and you Fourier restrict the function f uh, to each of these regions. So f um, uh, theta is uh, f theta hat is supported in here in one of these regions. All right, um, and the main theorem says that if you have a hypersurface with positive uh, or just definite uh, second fundamental form, uh, and if you have a function whose Fourier support is uh, inside this delta neighborhood of, uh, of your surface, then um, this inequality holds true. Uh, it is sharp in all possible ways, uh, except uh, perhaps for the epsilon dependence. Again, we never try to. Maybe you can get you know multiple logs instead of delta to minus epsilon, but nobody seems to care about that. Um, so it is some sort of a little tail inequality. Okay, you can think about uh, these regions as playing the role of um, the little tail uh, you know projections. And again, the lacunarity from one dimension is replaced with, uh, with curvature. I mean, curvature is all over the place and, uh, in, in, in this field and in, in our proofs in particular. OK. Um, so here's the theorem again. Um, and I want to point out that, um, again, there is a subcritical formulation which says that up to negligible losses, the norm of f is dominated by the square function. Uh, in the, let's say, Thomas Stein uh, or Stein Thomas uh, range. Um, and as I said earlier, this is sharp up to delta to minus epsilon losses. Um, I'll try to give you some hints about the proof of this theorem. Um, and I'll spend most of the time um, actually talking about applications um, because, um, you know, there's a wide range of applications. Um, in TDs, in um, let's say incidence geometry, and 
perhaps more importantly in uh, number theory. And we're still surprised to learn about new applications. I mean, uh, some of them were you know, known, I guess, uh, as potential applications for a long time, but uh, some of them are just surfacing um, uh, you know, these days. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the history of decouplings. I think nobody else called them uh, decouplings before. Um, they needed to have a name, and we came up with this name. You may you know, argue that it is an unfortunate name. It's such a general you know, uh, you know, term. Decouplings show up you know, all over the places. I think Bourguin could claim that he proved uh, about 100 or so decouplings, different sorts of decouplings in different sorts of contexts in you know, his, his, his proofs. Um, but you know, I like the name, in, uh, uh, on the other hand, because um, I, it sort of reflects what, what happens. You, know, you have this function, and you sort of decouple. You know, the function is the sum of um, you know, the Fourier projections over various regions, and you decouple them uh, via some um, you know, sort of, um, complicated orthogonality uh, you know, argument. Um, so going back to the history, uh, Tom Wolfe, I uh, was, I believe, the first to look at um, uh, these sorts of uh, things um, in what is probably his last paper. Um, and he proved LT decoupling. So we prove L2. He looked at LT. And he looked at the cone. The cone has one zero principal curvature. So it doesn't quite fit into our theory. Um, and he came up with this not for the sake of the problem, which is interesting in its own, but uh, in order to derive um, the local smoothing for the wave equation. And he made some progress, and then um, Isabella and uh, Wolf, um, you know, continued this work uh, in, in higher dimensions. And the method was, was also employed by uh, uh, Garrigos and uh, Zeger um, uh, uh, more recently, and they combined it with the uh, Tau's bilinear estimate. I'll get back to that. Um, on the next slides, um, to prove an L2 decoupling, so a particular range in our theorem um, for, for P, you know, large enough. <coughs> um, so all the developments after 2010 relied on the so-called multilinear uh, restriction theorem, which is due to Bennett, Carberry, and Tao. Um, this theorem, for those of you which do not work in, in restriction theories, is a bit uh, harder to, to read, I guess, and to, to digest, especially in, um, in such a hurry. I thought I would uh, put um, back the Stein-Thomas theorem to, to have a comparison. Um, so, so what is the difference? The difference now is that um, in the bennett carberry tau you no longer look at the Fourier extension, I mean, that's what this creature should be called, actually, right? You extend, uh, <coughs> you Fourier extend uh, the function g. Um, so you no longer have one function, but you look at trans transverse regions. In this case, uh, um, you know, there's, there's two of them in the sense that the normals, um, whatever two normals you pick from those regions, uh, they are not. Um, uh, producing a degenerate set of vectors in this span the whole um, uh, Rn. So if you take um, n, such fun n such regions on your hypersurface in n dimensions, and if you take the geometric um, average, this is getting better in the sense that um, you can lower the exponent um, from the stein thomas index to the 2n over n minus 1 index. Okay? <clears throat> so this is a stronger estimate um, than this one. It's, it's local. Um, there's an n to the epsilon here, um, which uh, is only mildly annoying, but uh, essentially uh, it, it, it can be discarded for practical purposes. And what you have on the right-hand side is, again, the natural quantity to put. Right? It's also a geometric average of the L2 norms of the function. OK, so this was a um, celebrated uh, uh, theorem. And um, it wasn't clear when, when the theorem appeared in 2006, there was this sense that uh, it's going to have plenty of applications, that it's going to solve the restriction uh, uh, theorem completely. Uh, however, nothing happened for a few years. There was 
no you know um, um, idea on how to how to employ it in in any context um, and it was uh, Bourguin and uh, Guth uh, a few years later I believe in 2010 which uh, came up with the um, uh, uh, appropriate induction on scales argument which which you know uh, used this theorem properly and somehow our decoupling theorem leaves um, uh, or is, is a child if you want of um, one of the many shells of this uh, uh, induction on scale argument. So I'll get back to that. Um, this is such a beautiful and important theorem that um, it deserves a few uh, more um, um, uh, explanations. And it actually is connected, it actually is equivalent with the so-called multilinear Kakea theorem. So let me talk a little bit about the Kakea problem. I think all of you have heard about the <coughs> you know, circle of Kakea conjectures. It, it doesn't hurt to um, talk a little bit more. So Kakea set in um, Rn is a set, let's say a measurable set, which contains a unit line segment in every uh, direction. The obvious example is the disk, the unit disk, but that's a silly example. It turns out that there are sets which have zero Lebesgue measure, and this was known even you know, 100 years ago. Um, the Lebesgue measure cannot somehow detect, uh, let's say, the you know some Kakea sets, but it turns out that the Hausdorff, I mean, th there is a conjecture, famous conjecture, uh, the Kakea set conjecture, which asserts that the Hausdorff dimension uh, should uh, should see the the Kakea sets, um, and you can formulate uh, the Kakea set conjecture using cubes. Um, so uh, let me again draw a picture. Um, in two dimensions, you're looking at <coughs> a delta, let's say a delta separated set of um, uh, cubes, which are one by delta. And um, you can have as many as you want. Um, you are cooking up the function, which is the sum of uh, the characteristic functions of the cubes. And uh, it is about an estimate in, uh, in this space, it's half of the two n over n minus one that showed up on the previous slides. And if you read it carefully, this is a quantified statement about the cubes being essentially disjoint, okay? There could be lots of overlaps at one point, but most of the places the cubes do not overlap, okay? Um, there's a whole hierarchy of conjectures. I'm not gonna talk about this. In the linear world, the restriction, the most general restriction theorem, which is open, implies the Kakea uh, conjectures, uh, the converse is not known to be true. However, as I said, that, that is true in the multilinear world. Uh, the state of the art is that uh, the Kakea conjectures are known in two dimensions, but they are very open in, in, in higher dimensions. For example, in dimension three, the best known bound is five halves due to Tom Wolf, and it's 20 years old now. Um, so, um, you can multilinearize the Kakea tubes conjecture as I indicated earlier. You take the geometric average over uh, sums of characteristic functions of cubes. Now in each family the cubes point in one of, um, well, in a direction inside one of these transverse regions. And it turns out that um, such an estimate becomes, um, I mean, T taking intersections of transverse cubes may, you know, improve, improves the estimate that you have on, uh, on, on this uh, uh, geometric average. Um, so this is um, the theorem that Bennett, Carberry, and Tao solved using uh, monotonicity arguments. I want to think about those methods as being somewhat operator theoretical in nature. However, um, Larry Guth um, proved uh, the endpoint I'm not giving you the whole story here, but he, he, he recovered in particular the um, bennett carberry tau result and his methods uh, used um, algebraic topology, uh, you know, very surprising proof, uh, the polynomial method in particular, I think it generated a lot of interesting um, uh, mathematics afterwards also. So there is this sense that, um, you know, topology in one way or another is behind um, the, you know, bennett uh, carberry tau theorem um, and um, yeah, I guess I want to I want to stop with this discussion. I could you know lecture for hours, but you know this time is, is limited. Um, so going back to more recent progress on the decoupling uh, 
conjecture. Um, the multilinear restriction theorem of Bennett, Carberry, and Tau immediately gives you the decoupling conjecture in the small range, right? Know that this index is less than the Stein-Thomas index, and also in the multilinear, um, the multilinear case, right? So it's it's an immediate implication. And Burgan, uh, right after you know the you know Burgan Guth uh, paper, you know as a byproduct of that, he he managed to combine this immediate estimate uh, with the, their induction on scale argument, and he recovered the um, uh, decoupling conjecture again in this uh, smaller range, um, and um, you know there was a gap left between these two indices and uh, that's where, you know, uh, we, we, we did the work that I'm describing now. Um, so what do we do? Well, we still use um, um, uh, the bennett carberry tau result, but, but we come up with a new iteration uh, argument that, that makes the efficient, the most efficient use, I guess, of, of this theorem. And I'm not gonna describe that uh, argument because it's, you know, slightly more complicated, okay? So this is, uh, this is the story of, um, uh, about the history of the problem. Um, and um, in the end of the talk, if I have time, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, a similar story for curves, right? So this is the story for hypersurfaces. Um, I'll now move to applications. Um, I've already mentioned um, the first one, the discrete restriction theorem, which I originally formulated as a conjecture. Um, so here it is again. It says that for um, the Stein-Thomas critical index, the two quantities are comparable, the LP norm and the LP norm. How do you recover this from the decoupling conjecture? Well, you simply plug in it's that simple, indeed. You simply plug in a um, function in your decoupling theorem whose Fourier transform is this measure of some of Dirac delta, right? So you have the coefficients, the Dirac. It's a simple limiting argument, in other words. Um, now you might ask, remember I said in the beginning that the continuous Stein-Thomas theorem is equivalent with an estimate for the exponential sum. This is not true here. This seems to be much weaker you know, it's uh, yeah, much weaker than our decoupling conjecture. You know, we are consequence of it. All right, but it's uh, it's it's this kind of inequality that shows up a lot in uh, um, mathematics. So let's start with the TDEs. Uh, if you have a bunch of thetas between one half and two, then you can uh, cook up the associated Laplacian on the irrational torus. Um, Example to have in mind is when all the thetas are one, and in that case, you're looking at the classical periodic torus. So what is the Laplacian? It's the um, you know, linear operator whose Fourier multiplier is given by um, this expression, right? And um, you can look at the associated Schrodinger uh, equation with initial data phi. Uh, this is what, um, this is the solution at time t the classical solution. And now you see the reason why all these things are called Strickhardt's estimates because the, the discrete uh, restriction for the lattice parabola that I mentioned earlier can be phrased in terms of solutions uh, to the Schrodinger equation. And right after 1993 when Bourguin has produced his work and came up with you know, so many methods uh, to uh, attack the periodic torus, there has been a lot of interest from different groups in the aperiodic torus, right? The, uh, the rational or irrational uh, torus. Um, and there were all sorts of uh, partial results in this direction using, you know, some uh, quite involved number theory. Well, our theorem, again, uh, gives the, um, the sharp range for arbitrary, you know, uh, irrational or, or rational tori, irrational tori in general. Um, this theorem is sharp in all possible ways except for uh, the epsilon dependence. Um, and um, it actually turns out that, um, first of all, our proof doesn't have anything to do with number theory. It's entirely free analytic. The L2 decoupling theorem is 
you know, free analytic results. Um, and uh, second, in the case of the periodic torus, there is a simple epsilon removal argument that's actually contained in Bourdieu's original paper in 93, which shows that there's no epsilon in this year. So this is very sharp then, right? This is true for all p greater than uh, the stein thomas index. There is an epsilon depend, and epsilon is needed, as Bourgain showed in the critical index. So this is rather pleasing, and um, there are some questions left about uh, the exact constant at the end point. Uh, I have some approaches in mind, but I'm not going to talk about now. All right. Um, there's also a similar story for the, the sphere, right? You can look at the lattice points on the sphere rather than per volley. There's also a PD associated with that. It's called the Hamholtz equation. It's time independent. So the natural thing uh, to do there is to look at um, eigenfunction estimates. So in particular, you have the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the torus. And um, I'm using this to denote the sphere, um, the integer points or lattice points on the sphere radius n, which are the exponential sums. The conjecture is that for an index um, slightly larger, actually, than the stein thomas index, um, you, you have an inverse Hilder. Now, the reason there is a discrepancy in this discrete world, there's no discrepancy in the continuous world, right? The stein thomas theorem says, for the index 2n plus 1 over n minus 1, whether it's the sphere or the parabolic or anything else which has um, positive definite fundamental form, the same estimate should hold. There's a difference sphere to the parabolic, and this is due to the fact, I mean, in a naive way at least, uh, due to the fact that um, the points on the sphere, the lattice points on the sphere uh, are quite irregular. There's regions on the sphere where there's gaps, and there's regions where, you know, the you have the right number of points. Well, on the parabolid, uh, the points are sort of equidistant because the way you generate the lattice points on the parabolid is by just lifting up um, the very well distributed lattice points on the you know, projected uh, n minus one dimensional space. So you don't have the correct number of points or lattice points on the sphere, and that is what's behind, I guess, um, uh, you know, the slight uh, discrepancy. Okay. Um, so about a year or so ago, I gave talks about uh, what was then the state of the art. Uh, we did some work uh, with, with Jean um, uh, on the sphere and came up with some sort of with bad exponents using some slightly heavy number theory, uh, such as the Ziegel mass formula, some incidence geometry, and free analysis. Um, well, it turns out that our L2 decoupling theorem can beat uh, all these results, again, without any use of number theory. So I'm listing here the consequence. Um, we recover this sharp theorem. Well, it's not sharp in the sense that we don't quite get to the um, exponent. This is slightly larger than um, the exponent that we have here. But otherwise, of course, the independence is, uh, is sharp. Now, this could be, on the other hand, uh, the reach or the limitation of free analysis. It may be that to go beyond this, you are going to need some number theory. You're going to need some, um, you know, heavier tools which detect these irregularities of, of the points on, on, on the sphere. Our tools do not care about uh, those and, you know, address actually arbitrary points, you know, on the sphere. They, they, they don't see the integer uh, aspect of the problem. Um, there's also some cute uh, uh, connections to incidence uh, geometry. Um, and additive combinatorics depends on the taste on, on how to call these things. Um, one um, important um, concept in this field is that of, uh, of the energy, let's say the K energy. So what is this? So you have a set lambda. Then you're looking at the 2K tuples um, in lambda to the power 2K for which we have this kind of coincidence. Okay. It is always the case that this k energy is at least as large as lambda to the power k because given any uh, choice of k points, I can duplicate that and I get, um, you know, uh, one, one such tuple. And the extreme sets, those which for which the energy is not larger, much larger than that, or for which uh, alternatively the energy is um, 
uh, much larger than lambda to the k r, r of interest in additive combinatorics. Um, and um, our discrete restriction theorem, for example, in, in, in two dimensions, I'm just cooking up the simplest possible example, uh, shows that if you have a bunch of well-separated uh, points on the unit circle or the parabola, um, then the energy, the free energy is not too bad. I mean, there's not many coincidences. You cannot cook up six tuples which conspire, you know, to create equalities too often, right? How would you get something like this? Remember, we had such an estimate for R large enough. You let R go to infinity, and um, the six tuples that survive through this limiting procedure are precisely those for which uh, you have an equality, as I indicated earlier for, you know, in the case of the squares, and that's it. Uh, we don't have any other proof, and I spend a lot of time with this, so we don't have any other, uh, you know, uh, incidence geometric proof uh, for this equality. Uh, you can reduce it um, to the case of incidences between uh, circles and points, but without relying on some heavy conjectures, such as the unit distance conjecture and so on, we, we cannot prove it. So I think it's interesting in its own. Um, and uh, the interesting question, I mean, I gave this talk at IPAM, uh, there's this program on, uh, on incidence geometry, so I used to post many of these questions and um, uh, maybe somebody will, will solve them, so I'm posting them here too. One interesting question is, if you can remove this um, well-separated assumption, is it true that for any collection of points on the unit circle or the parabola, um, the energy um, is not uh, too bad? Why would you care about this? Uh, if you have a positive answer, then you would solve a, this now famous conjecture by Bourgain and Bombieri. They wrote a pretty long paper which uses elliptic curves, and they proved this conjecture in some very particular cases when uh, the points are the lattice points for some particular types of radii. Um, I believe there shouldn't be any elliptic curve theory there. It's entirely, I believe, a free analytic uh, uh, result. And why do I believe this is true? Uh, to make it more precise, um, there is a thing called the unit distance conjecture, which is formulated here. It says that given any n points in the plane, uh, there could be at most n to the power 1 plus epsilon unit distances among them. Um, this is so strong that it has uh, the Erdős distance conjecture as an immediate cor corollary, however perceived to be much harder, but everybody believes it to be true. If you take this for granted, then this follows. Um, there's more to the story, but again, I don't have time to um, uh, get into these kind of uh, details. Uh, there's some uh, nice consequences in, in three dimensions also where the critical index is uh, four, so it's again an even integer. Um, and there's further connections to the semi trotter theorem, um, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll skip this part. Okay, so let's now go to number theory where I think um, the most surprising um, uh, applications uh, have emerged. Um, I'll start with Diophantine inequalities. This is just one example of those. I think uh, Trevor Woolley will mention either this one or uh, another um, uh, of our inequalities in, in his talk. I think he can reprove it uh, using number theory. Um, so here's one example, one of many examples. Uh, you consider this system. Um, it has some energy flavor. It obviously has some trivial solutions, as I indicated earlier. And the question is to look at well, one question, one possible question that the number theorists have addressed um, was to look at uh, the asymptotic number for the non-trivial solution. Let's call them UK of n. And there's lots of motivations, such as you know the worrying problem and so on. And uh, this curve is also famous. 1k equals 3 is the Osegro cubic. Um, and uh, there's a lot of delicate work in number theory on trying to get, uh, you know, the, 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 sharp, uh, the sharp bounds. Um, we cannot do anything like this. Okay, our methods do not, you know, again, provide such fine estimates. You know, log n, I mean, it's never there. However, you can look at uh, this problem from a different point of view. You can enlarge uh, the window. Okay, so here, care about... Uh, perfect equalities, but what if 
you are giving yourself a window. Well, it turns out that uh, in this case also you have uh, roughly n to the three solutions, which is, you know, essentially the, the, the trivial solutions, right? Um, and how would you approach this problem? Um, well, you apply our discrete uh, restriction theorem to the curve C, C to the K away from the origin so that you have, um, you know, a good curvature um, in, in, in that region. Um, and it's, it's nothing more than an application, okay, of that. I mean, there's no number theory involved here. There's no number theory. Um, now, uh, very recently, um, in part motivated by, by questions from number theory, we have looked at the decoupling theory for curves. So rather than having the points spread over a whole hypersurface, you now have a thin set such as a curve in, in n dimensions. You have your, your frequencies sitting there. And um, you want to see what kind of uh, reverse Hilder um, you have. So I'm not going to be as precise as before. Um, I'll just give you, you know, some, some consequences. The typical example to have in mind, or the, the curve has to have some, some torsion, right? It doesn't have to be sitting inside a hyperplane. The typical example is, um, um, is this curve. I'm not sure if it has a name. Um, and um, what we can prove right now, but this is very much work in, in progress, it looks very exciting, um, is that there is a decoupling um, inequality in, in this range, okay? Um, namely, you know, if the set lambda is delta separated, then um, you can even put the coefficients Ax here, you can even put uh, L2, I mean, this is part of an earlier talk that I gave, but now we, now we know how to improve this result even in these regards. And why, why would you care about this kind of result? Why, what kind of consequences would you have by, by looking at the frequency points on the curve? Well, here's one. So it's about the so-called uh, Vinogradov's uh, mean value theorem. Um, um, right, so this theorem is about um, the energy of a certain level, uh, let's call it uh, K or S, I guess, in uh, Willis notation, of, um, of this set. Okay, so how many uh, integers do you have for which um, um, let's say N uh, well, n is the dimension, I want to write m1 plus um, ms equals uh, ms plus 1, m2s, and then you want to uh, put powers 2 up to, um, well, in our case, um, which one was the case there? So, I hope it's clear. So you consider a system of um, exactly k uh, equalities involving the, the powers of the integers and uh, you have uh, s numbers on each side. And um, the conjecture is that uh, for certain uh, critical value of um, k, or rather s, I should say, uh, there aren't uh, solutions beyond the trivial ones. So using our notation, it's much easier to, to formulate this question in terms of, um, in terms of the energy. Uh, it is conjectured, this is the Vinogradov mean value theorem, that you can replace this number, um, so 2m plus 1 or minus 1, um, is supposed to be uh, replaced with um, n times m plus 1 uh, over 2. So note that our result um, at this moment, it's still uh, beyond this conjecture. Of course, uh, Trevor Woolley has made a lot of uh, significant progress um, over the last years, um, and he's now close to solving this conjecture. However, um, last year, um, around this time, I guess, if I'm reading archives correctly, uh, this result would have seemed new. So there was a lot of... Um, uh, you know, many years, maybe half a century or so, when there was no progress on this problem beyond the trivial range. And then Trevor came with uh, his um, uh, method um, 
a few years ago, but la last year this would have been a new result, at least in dimension three and four or so. Uh, bottom line is that um, our methods, again, being entirely free analytic, do not um, appreciate or do not care about the fact that these are integers. All we care about is uh, the points having the right separation. So in fact, even though we cannot prove at the moment uh, uh, the full conjecture, we can prove it in a significant range um, uh, for you know, rather arbitrary points. And we see, more, more, most importantly, we see no restriction on why our method wouldn't extend to the whole range. So in the case of hypersurfaces, we have the sharp decoupling conjecture. We believe that the sharp decoupling conjecture in, uh, in the case of the curves, the one that would prove the whole conjecture, the uh, uh, mean value theorem conjecture, um, so we prove that that should be accessible through free analytic methods, okay? Um, but whether or not we'll get it, uh, it's, it's a different question. Um, and finally, um, in the remaining uh, few minutes, um, I want to, um, well, before I go there, since I seem to have five minutes, um, I want to point out that the way, going back to this theorem, the way we get this theorem, um, well, there's two different approaches. One of them is to um, use convolution and go from curves to hypersurfaces. You can cook up hypersurfaces from curves, okay, and maybe that's a more or less standard way. But there's a different, uh, different way that uh, we are understanding um, uh, right now. Namely, there is a multi-linear restriction theorem for curves, um, which is almost trivial. Okay, um, in the sense that while well, the tubes from the hypersurface case become plates, and um, while well, bottom line is that tubes, if I give you two tubes, you know, long tubes in three dimensions or even, well, let's say two dimensions, uh, three dimensions, two tubes are very easy to miss each other, right? Because they are very thin and they are, you know, spread all over the place. Um, however, the plates, you, you think about plates as being essentially planes, you know, think and down planes. The, the planes, you know, two planes in three dimensions never miss each other, right? Uh, unless they are, you know, I'm talking about the transverse case. And that makes a difference. So the bottom line is that this theorem is quite elementary. It doesn't rely on anything, you know, too deep, I would say. Um, which means that uh, this interesting from my point of view, range, which was open until recently, I mean, this, this one can be recovered now by rather elementary uh, methods. Um, uh, all right. Um, finally, um, there is another surprising uh, connection with the Lindelof hypothesis. Um, you look at the Riemann zeta function on the critical line, and it's conjectured that it doesn't grow too badly as it goes to infinity. Um, this is supposed to be much easier than the Riemann hypothesis. It follows from the Riemann hypothesis. It's still surprisingly open. I mean, it's, you know, there has been progress, but I think, um, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, the progress, mostly due to Huxley and his collaborators, um, has established um, this exponent in, in, in the place of epsilon. And, um, I think this method goes, uh, I mean, these methods go back to the work of Bombieri and Ivanitz, which have at their core an estimate on exponential sums. Um, perhaps the most recent one used by Huxley um, is, is this estimate, right? It's an L10 in four dimensions. The points n, n squared, and then, you know, these are the two entries um, sit on a curve. So this is really um, reflected in, um, in, in our work on the curves. Um, and uh, I mean, they get, they get this estimate via you know, number theory. There's a lot of um, uh, you know, hard little historical method and you know, other sorts of estimates. Um, it turns out that one can recover, and this was observed by Bourguin. It's an archive now. One can recover rather immediately, I would say, uh, this, uh, this inequality uh, from, uh, from the decoupling theorem for curves. You don't exploit um, uh, the nature of these things. You exploit the fact that n and n squared are integers in the sense that um, they, they give rise to a one periodic function. Okay? That, that's all we exploit about uh, n and n squared. It's a very mild 
exploitation of the integer aspects of this equation, but nothing, nothing more than that in terms of number theory. Um, there are further avenues that can be, um, um, you know, uh, you know, followed. It is conjectured, for example, that this should hold true with the 10 replaced by 12, and if you can prove that, then you can improve this exponent. Um, it seems now possible, at least in principle, you know, um, that that you know further refinements of our methods would uh, would lead to that. Um, so, um, you know, this is really my last slide, and my time has expired. I guess if there is one uh, moral to the whole story is that. Um, um, the big, the big surprise is the fact that uh, you know our methods are entirely free analytic. They recover lots of you know uh, results which have been previously um, obtained using completely different methods, in particular number theoretical methods. Um, it could be that um, you know our methods, being at least mildly topological in nature, um, you know are you know, managed to replace number theory simply by coming up with, you know, this different angle, you know, there's a lot of, you know, geometry and topology um, hidden in, um, uh, in various places of our argument. There's also a lot of induction on scales, which, you know, doesn't seem to be present explicitly, at least in the number theoretical arguments. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, point to reflect on why is it possible, you know, to recover simply recover, if not to improve all these results, without any number theory. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Well, uh, no, I think you're touching two slightly different issues. First of all, yes, um, the bilinear restriction theorem is understood. I mean, that goes back to the work of uh, Wolf and Tao. The nlinear, you know, the multilinear, if you want, uh, thing is, is known. Uh, you know, the first thing that's not known is, I guess, the trilinear estimate in four dimensions. And, uh, you know, these things are open. I think people are working on them. Uh, if you make progress or if you solve those conjectures, then you can make progress on uh, the restriction conjecture in, um, um, uh, in higher dimensions. Um, the other thing that I detect in your question is, um, you know, perhaps a decoupling theory for intermediate manifolds. What we understand is the dimension one and co-dimension one. Is there a decoupling theory for intermediate dimension? We don't know the answer to that. We don't have any applications. I guess we lack part of the motivation. There should be. Um, we thought about it, you know, in terms of heuristics, um, but um, you know, the whole I think the whole restriction theory is, is sort of missing in uh, this intermediate regime, right? I mean, even even the very elementary restriction theory. In terms of uh, the Kakea phenomenon, I think that has been also analyzed, maybe even by by uh, Andreas and uh, or maybe Richard Oberlin. I mean, you'd know that. I mean, this intermediate uh, dimension. Of, uh, Hmm? Right, right, right. Um, right. Uh, so I, I don't know too much about that literature. Um, I mean, I, I sort of, you know, bumped into this. We, we sort of bumped into this issue, of course. Um, I mentioned this earlier. For hypersurfaces, the Kakea problem is about cubes. For curves, the Kakea problem is about plates. Um, the, there are things in between where your parallelipeds, for example, are four dimensional and Two of the dimensions are n in terms of capital N in terms of length, and the other ones are squared of n. So there should be an interesting, uh, you know, combinatorics uh, in between. But no, we haven't looked at it you know, in detail. Sorry, which problem? The, 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 
Oh, um, I believe that this kind of theorem should hold for every p less than the Vinogradov index. I mean, scaling arguments, uh, I mean, I haven't played with it too much, but just based on scaling arguments, I see no reason why this shouldn't hold true for p less than this. At the moment, this is what we get by applying almost word by word our equation scheme and uh, what appears to be the sharp um, multilinear theorem in for curves. I haven't thought about that, but you're one of the guys that I have to talk with and I realize uh, this is very recent. This is very recent, so some, some feedback is uh, welcome. Well, no, um, so you're talking about what's called, I guess, the square function estimate. Um, so by the way, uh, this decoupling conjecture well, has so many consequences, but unfortunately it says nothing about the restriction conjecture, right? Um, the inequality that's relevant to the restriction conjecture would read as follows. Um, so I guess what you're suggesting is uh, placing the, um, LP norm outside. Well, Minkowski's inequality shows that this one is always less. It doesn't have to do anything with curvature, just, you know, Minkowski. Um, so we prove that this one is less than this. Um, this is expected to hold true in the smaller range. Um, you know, maybe I can write here between 2 and 2n over um, n minus 1. Uh, this is true, of course, in the range uh, here. Um, you know, these kind of things, even though they are weaker on the, from this point of view, they are good enough to produce all these consequences. We don't get any new consequences for exponential sums, I mean, um, if we know this inequality. No, we cannot say anything at the moment about this one. This is stronger than the restriction conjecture. It implies um, by itself the restriction conjecture. And it's a very easy